Greetings, everyone. We have people logging in from around the world right now. We want to give everyone a, a few minutes to log on, and we'll be beginning the meeting in just a few minutes. Greetings, everyone who's logging in online. We have people who are participating from all around the world and are beginning to, to log on. We will be beginning the meeting in just a couple minutes. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to our listeners all over the world. Welcome to the first in a series of five lectures marking the centenary of the Russian Revolution of 1917, presented by the International Committee of the Fourth International. My name is Joseph Kishore. I'm the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party in the United States, and I'll be introducing today's speaker, and moderating the question and answer portion of the event. We have a very large online audience today, and this is truly a global presentation, which is appropriate for the subject. We have people listening in from Europe in the late evening, from South Asia in the middle of the night, from Australia and China in the early morning, and from Latin America, the United States, and Canada in the afternoon. We are marking the centenary of the Russian Revolution, the monumental event in the history of the 20th century, not only for Russia and Eastern Europe, but for the entire world. We are holding this lecture and marking the centenary under conditions of an extraordinary crisis of the world capitalist system. All the issues addressed and fought out 100 years ago are of great contemporary relevance. Our topic today is Why Study the Russian Revolution? And our speaker is David North. Comrade North has been an active member in the socialist movement for nearly half a century. He became National Secretary of the Workers' League, the forerunner of the Socialist Equality Party in 1976. He played the leading role in the struggle of the International Committee against national opportunism and the post-Stalinist school of historical falsification. He was National Secretary of the SEP from its formation in 1995 through 2008 when he became its National Chairman. He has been the Chairperson of the International Editorial Board of the World Socialist website since it was established in 1998, nearly 20 years ago. The WSWS 
is the most widely read socialist publication on the internet. North's writings on history, politics, and Marxist theory are well known. He is the author of countless articles and numerous books, including The Heritage We Defend, A Contribution to the History of the Fourth International, In Defense of Leon Trotsky, The Russian Revolution and the Unfinished Twentieth Century, The Frankfurt School, Postmodernism, and the Politics of the Pseudo-Left, A Marxist Critique, and most recently, A Quarter Century of War, The U.S. Drive for Global Hegemony, 1990 to 2016. Following the lecture, we will have a question and answer period. For those listening in through the centenary page of the WSWS, you will see a commenting feature beneath the YouTube stream where you can submit your questions. You can also email us directly at sep at socialistequality.com. It's sep at socialistequality.com. You will also see links to find out more about joining the SEP in your country and to donate to the WSWS to help make this and other events like it possible. There's also a link to register for the Centenary Lecture Series. If you've not already done so, I would urge you to register now to get updates on subsequent lectures in this series and other information. Finally, if you are listening to this stream directly on YouTube, you can access all of this and more at wsws.org 1917. With that, I would like you all to welcome Comrade David North. Well, thank you very much, Comrade Kishore. The title of this lecture is Why Study the Russian Revolution? I will sacrifice the element of suspense by answering this question, not at the conclusion, but at the beginning of this presentation. Reason one, the Russian Revolution was the most important, consequential, and progressive political event of the 20th century. Despite the ultimately tragic fate of the Soviet Union, which was destroyed by the betrayals and crimes of the Stalinist bureaucracy, no other event in the past century had such a far-reaching impact on the lives of hundreds of millions of people on every part of the planet. Reason two, the Russian Revolution, culminating in the conquest of political power by the Bolshevik Party in October 1917, marked a new stage in world history. The overthrow of the bourgeois provisional government proved that an alternative to capitalism was not a utopian dream, but rather a real possibility that could be achieved through the conscious political struggle of the working class. Reason three, the October Revolution substantiated in practice the materialist conception of history as formulated by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. The establishment of Soviet power under the leadership of the Bolshevik Party verified an essential element of Marxist historical theory. As Marx wrote, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Reason four, the objective development of the Russian Revolution substantiated the strategic perspective first elaborated by Leon Trotsky between 1906-07, known as the theory of permanent revolution. Trotsky foresaw that the democratic revolution in Russia entailing the overthrow of the Tsarist autocracy, the destruction of all vestiges of semi-feudal economic and political relations, the elimination of national oppression, could be achieved only through the conquest of state power by the working class. This democratic revolution, in which the working class played the leading role in opposition to the capitalist class, would develop rapidly into a socialist revolution. Reason five, the seizure of power by the Bolshevik party in October 1917 and the establishment of the first worker state inspired an immense development in the class consciousness and political awareness of the working class and oppressed masses throughout the world. The Russian revolution marked the beginning of the end 
of the old system of colonial rule established by imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th century. It radicalized the international working class and set into motion a worldwide revolutionary movement of the oppressed masses. The major social gains won by the international working class, including the formation of industrial unions in the United States in the 1930s, the defeat of Nazi Germany in the 1940s, the implementation of the social welfare policies of the post-World War II era, and the process of decolonization were all products of the Russian Revolution. Reason six. In its struggle against imperialist war, the Bolshevik Party proved, in theory and in practice, that socialist internationalism is the essential foundation of revolutionary strategy and the practical struggle for power. Arising out of the global contradictions of the capitalist system, the fate of the Russian Revolution depended on the development of the world socialist revolution. As Trotsky was to explain, and I quote, The completion of the socialist revolution within national limits is unthinkable. One of the basic reasons for the crisis in bourgeois society is the fact that the productive forces created by it can no longer be reconciled with the framework of the national state. From this follow, on the one hand, imperialist wars, on the other, the utopia of the United States of Europe. The socialist revolution begins on the national arena. It unfolds on the international arena and is completed on the world arena. Thus, the socialist revolution becomes a permanent revolution in a newer and broader sense of the word. It attains completion only in the final victory of the new society on our entire planet. End of quote. It is difficult to believe that these words were written 88 years ago. Amidst mounting international geopolitical tensions and the chaos engulfing the European Union, one might believe that Trotsky's reference to imperialist wars and the utopia of the United States of Europe had just been posted online in today's edition of Le Monde or the Financial Times. The enduring relevance and freshness of Trotsky's observation testifies to the fact that the historical problems with which he grappled in the first decades of the 20th century remain unsolved in the first decades of the 21st. Reason 7. The Russian Revolution demands serious study as a critical episode in the development of scientific social thought. The historical achievement of the Bolsheviks in 1917 both demonstrated and actualized the essential relationship between scientific materialist philosophy and revolutionary practice. The evolution of the Bolshevik party vindicated Lenin's statement in what is to be done. Without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. As Lenin continuously insisted, Marxism is the most highly developed form of philosophical materialism, which critically reworked and assimilated the genuine achievements of classical German idealism, chiefly that of Hegel, that is, dialectical logic, and the recognition of the active role of historically evolving social practice in the cognition of objective reality. Lenin's unflagging defense of philosophical materialism and the materialist conception of history recorded in published works spanning a period of nearly 30 years, from 1895 to 1922, expressed his profound intellectual conviction that, and I quote, the highest task of humanity is to comprehend this objective logic of economic evolution, the evolution of social life, in its general and fundamental features so that it may be possible to adapt to it one's social consciousness and the consciousness of the advanced classes of all capitalist countries in as definite, clear, and critical a fashion as possible. Unquote. 
The conquest of power by the working class in October 1917 was a historical high point as yet unsurpassed in mankind's adaptation of its consciousness as expressed in the political action of the working class to the objective logic of economic evolution. Reason 8. The development of Bolshevism as a political tendency and the exceptional role that it played in the tumultuous events of 1917 vindicated the essential significance of the struggle waged by Marxists against opportunism and its political sibling, centrism. Lenin's fight against the political opportunism and Menshevism in Russia and his struggle against the Second International's betrayal of socialist internationalism following the outbreak of the imperialist war in 1914 forged the political identity of the party that led the struggle for power in 1917. Applying the materialist conception of history, Lenin sought to uncover the social and economic interests that found expression in the conflict of political tendencies. On this basis, Lenin identified opportunism, and especially that of the Second International, as the expression of the material interests of a privileged stratum of the working class and sections of the middle class allied with imperialism. Reason 9. The Bolsheviks provided the working class with an example of what a genuine revolutionary party is and the irreplaceable role of such a party in securing the victory of the Socialist Revolution. A careful study of the revolutionary process in 1917 leaves no doubt that its presence, that the presence of the Bolshevik Party, with Lenin and Trotsky in its leadership, was decisive in securing the victory of the Socialist Revolution. The movement of the Russian working class, supported by a revolutionary uprising of the peasantry, assumed gigantic dimensions in 1917. But no realistic reading of the events of that year permits the conclusion that the working class would have come to power without the leadership provided by the Bolshevik party. Drawing the essential lessons of this experience, Trotsky later insisted, quote, the role and responsibility of the leadership of the working class in a revolutionary epoch is colossal, end of quote. This conclusion remains as valid in the present historical situation as it was in 1917. Reason 10. The course of events between February, March, and October, November 1917 is not merely of historical interest. The experience of those crucial months provides an invaluable and enduring insight into strategical and tactical problems that the working class will encounter during a new and inevitable upsurge of revolutionary struggle. As Trotsky wrote in 1924, for the laws and methods of proletarian revolution, there is up to the present time no more important and profound a source than our October experience. The crimes of Stalinism, a reactionary and anti-Marxist national bureaucratic reaction against the program and principles of Bolshevism, do not invalidate the October Revolution and its genuine achievements, including those realized by the Soviet state during the 74 years of its existence. In this new period of global crisis of the capitalist system, a renewed study of the Russian Revolution and the assimilation of its lessons is the inescapable prerequisite for finding a way out of the present social, economic, and political impasse. This is the first of five lectures. It is my hope that over the next two months, these lectures will expand upon and validate the reasons I have given for a careful study of the Russian Revolution. Now let us proceed to examine the events of 1917. Exactly 100 years ago this week, on March 8, 1917, meetings and demonstrations took place in Petrograd, the capital of Imperial Russia, in celebration of International Women's Day. 
as Russia still adhered to the Julian calendar, which was 13 days behind the Gregorian calendar used virtually everywhere else. The date of this event in Petrograd was February 23, 1917. For the rest of this lecture, when referring to events that transpired within Russia, I will use the date of the calendar then in use. By the time these protests began, the great powers of Europe, Germany and Austria-Hungary on one side, France, Britain, and Russia on the other, had been at war for two years and seven months. Between August 1914 and the beginning of March 1917, the governments of all the warring countries, regardless of whether they were ruled by parliaments or monarchs, squandered human life with criminal indifference. During the year 1916, the battlefields of Europe were drenched with blood. The Battle of Verdun waged over 303 days. From February 21st to December 18th, 1916, cost approximately 715,000 French and German casualties. This amounts to 70,000 casualties a month. The total number of soldiers killed at Verdun was 300,000. Simultaneously, another ghastly battle was being fought in France in the vicinity of the Somme River. On the first day of the battle, July 1st, 1916, the British Army suffered more than 57,000 casualties. By the time the carnage ended on November 18th, 1916, the number of British, French, and German soldiers killed or wounded exceeded one million. On the Eastern Front, Russian forces were arrayed against those of Germany and Austria-Hungary. In June 1916, the Tsarist regime launched an offensive commanded by General Brusilov. By the time the offensive was concluded in September, the Russian army had suffered between 500,000 and 1 million casualties. Over the past century, innumerable historians have condemned the violence of the Russian Revolution and the supposed inhumanity of the Bolsheviks. But the moralists of the academy breeze over the fact, if they take notice of it at all, that before the revolution had claimed a single victim, more than one and three-quarter million Russian soldiers had perished in the war, launched by the Tsarist autocracy in 1914, with the enthusiastic support of the Russian bourgeoisie. No one could have predicted that the specific protest planned for February 23rd would mark the beginning of the revolution. But that the war would give rise to revolution had been foreseen. As early as 1915, Trotsky had written, I quote, A working class that has been through the school of war will feel the need of using the language of force as soon as the first serial op- serious obstacle faces them within their own country. End of quote. Lenin had based the anti-war policy of the Bolsheviks upon the conviction that the contradictions of imperialism as a world system, which had led to war, would also lead to socialist revolution. In a lecture delivered in Zurich on January 22, 1917, the 12th anniversary of the Bloody Sunday Massacre in St. Petersburg that provided the spark that ignited the revolution of 1905, Lenin counseled his small audience. Quote, We must not be deceived by the present grave-like stillness in Europe. Europe is pregnant with revolution. The monstrous horrors of imperialist war, the suffering caused by the high cost of living everywhere, engender a revolutionary mood. And the ruling classes, the bourgeoisie and its servitors, the governments, are more and more moving into a blind alley from which they can never extricate themselves without tremendous upheavals. And yet, as is so often the case at the start of great historic events, the anonymous demonstrators who assembled on February 23rd did not foresee the consequences of their actions. 
How could they have imagined on that Thursday morning that they were about to change the course of history? By that point in the war, the social crisis in Russia was so acute that working class strikes and other forms of protests were hardly unusual. Petrograd had been shaken by a massive strike on January 9th involving 140,000 workers from more than 100 factories. Another major strike of 84,000 workers took place on February 14th. But it was still not clear that tensions were building rapidly toward the eruption of full-scale revolution. Nicholas Sukhanov, the left Menshevik, who authored an invaluable memoir of the events of 1917, recalled the discussion about the growing unrest between two young typists at his workplace on February 21st. He was taken aback when one of these women said to the other, You know, if you ask me, it's the beginning of the revolution. What do these silly girls know about revolution? Sukhanov thought to himself. Revolution. Highly improbable. Revolution. Everyone knew this was only a dream. A dream of generations. Of long, laborious decades. Without believing the girls, I repeated after them mechanically. Yes, the beginning of the revolution. As it turned out, These politically unschooled young women had a better sense of reality than the experienced but deeply skeptical Menshevik. On February 22nd, the management at the massive Pudilov plant locked out 30,000 workers. The next day, in a city boiling with class tensions, against the backdrop of a horrifying war, the Women's Day protests began. protests were not called in the name of Russia's 99%, as today's affluent middle-class pseudo-left defines its constituency, combining in great melting pot the totally impoverished with those whose net worth is calculated in the millions. The Petrograd demonstrators of 1917 were from and represented the interests of the working class of the imperial capital. Their political concerns were focused not on issues of individual lifestyle, but on those of social class. They shouted, down with the war, down with the high cost of living, down with hunger, bread for the workers. The women marched to the factories and appealed to the workers for support. By the end of the day, more than 100,000 workers were out on strike. As the protests grew in scope over the next several days, it gradually became clear that the fate of the regime was at stake. Escalating violence by the police had been unable to stop the demonstrations. The working class noticed that the soldiers who had been summoned to restore order seemed increasingly sympathetic to the protests and reluctant to execute the orders of their commanders. By the fourth day, the working class had committed itself to the overthrow of the regime. The homicidal violence of the police who deployed machine guns against the demonstrators and mowed down hundreds met with implacable resistance. The outcome of the struggle now depended on the regiments stationed in Petrograd. Contemporary historians have substantiated Trotsky's description of the growing fraternal interaction between workers and soldiers. Professor Rex Wade writes in his account of the February Revolution, and I quote, The soldiers of 1917 were not the same ones who had suppressed revolution in 1905. Most were new recruits, only partially accustomed to military discipline. Many were from the Petrograd region. During February 23rd to 26th, there had been hundreds of conversations between these soldiers and the crowds in which the former were reminded of their common interest with the latter, of the general injustice and hardships of the population, including the soldiers' own families, and of the common desire to end the war. The experience of firing on the crowds seriously disturbed them. 
heated discussions about the events were going on in many units. The process of fraternization took its toll on military discipline. To quote Max Eastman's brilliant narration of the documentary from Tsar to Lenin, and I quote again, for the first time in history the Tsar's soldiers failed him. Instead of using their rifles to restore order, they completed the disorder by joining the people in the streets. End of quote. In later accounts of the revolution, memoirists, journalists, and historians have contrasted the mass uprising of February to the Bolshevik-led insurrection of October. All too frequently, the aim of this comparison has been to denigrate the role of conscious leadership, implying or asserting that the presence of a politically conscious leadership detracts from the moral purity of revolutionary action. The presence of a leadership is identified with political conspiracy, disrupting the normal and legitimate flow of events. The use of the word spontaneous is intended to convey a blissful absence of political consciousness, with the masses acting on little more than vague democratic instincts. As a matter of historical fact, this conception of Unconscious spontaneity mystifies, distorts, and falsifies the revolution of 1917. It is true that the Russian working class and the masses of soldiers, many of peasant origins, did not clearly foresee the consequences of their actions, nor were their actions guided by a worked-out revolutionary strategy. But the working masses did possess a sufficient level of social and political consciousness formed over many decades of direct and inherited experience, which enabled them to assess the events of February, draw conclusions, and make decisions. Their thought was deeply influenced by a culture that had developed beneath the weight of terrible oppression, which had been scarred by social and personal tragedies, and inspired by astonishing examples of heroic self-sacrifice. In 1920, reviewing the origins of Bolshevism, Lenin paid tribute to the long struggle to develop a socialist political culture and movement, with deep roots in the working class and capable of influencing the broad mass of the oppressed population. He wrote, For about a half a century, Approximately from the 40s to the 90s of the last century, progressive thought in Russia, oppressed by a most brutal and reactionary Tsarism, sought eagerly for a correct revolutionary theory and followed with the utmost diligence and thoroughness each and every last word in this sphere in Europe and America. Russia achieved Marxism, the only correct revolutionary theory, through the agony she experienced in the course of a half-century of unparalleled torment and sacrifice, of unparalleled revolutionary hero heroism, incredible energy, devoted searching, study, practical trial, disappointment, verification, and comparison with European experience. Thanks to the political emigration caused by Tsarism, revolutionary Russia in the second half of the 19th century acquired a wealth of international links and excellent information on the forms and theories of the world revolutionary movement, such as no other country possessed. End of quote. During the 35 years that preceded the February Revolution, the working class movement in Russia developed in close and continuous interaction with socialist organizations. These organizations, with their leaflets, newspapers, lectures, schools, and legal and illegal activities played an immense role in the social, culture, cultural, and intellectual life of the working class. It is impossible to remove this ubiquitous socialist and Marxist presence from the life and experience of the Russian working class as it developed from the early 1880s through the upheaval of 1905 and up to the outbreak of the February Revolution. 
the pioneering work of Plekhanov, Axelrod, and Potrasov, had not been in vain. It was precisely the extraordinary interaction over many decades of the social experience of the working class and Marxist theory, actualized in the persistent efforts of the cater of the revolutionary movement that formed and nourished the high intellectual and political level of the so-called spontaneous consciousness of the masses in February 1917. Serious historical research has proved the direct and critical role played by highly class-conscious workers in organizing and directing the February movement and leading it to the overthrow of the autocracy. The answer given by Trotsky to the question, who led the February Revolution, is entirely correct. Quote, conscious and tempered workers, educated for the most part by the party of Lenin. But as Trotsky hastened to add, quote, this leadership proved sufficient to guarantee the victory of the insurrection, but it was not adequate to transfer immediately into the hands of the proletarian vanguard the leadership of the revolution. End of quote. By the afternoon of Monday, February 27th, the dynastic regime of the Romanovs, which had ruled Russia since 1613, had been swept away by the mass movement of workers and soldiers. With the destruction of the old regime, the political question of what would replace the autocracy immediately emerged. The confused and frightened political representatives of the Russian bourgeoisie assembled in the Torida Palace. They established a temporary committee of the State Duma that soon after constituted itself as the provisional government. The main concern of the bourgeoisie, terrified by the mass movement, was to bring the revolution under control as quickly as it could, to limit as much as possible any injury to the material interests of the wealthy and the owners of private property, and to continue Russia's participation in the imperialist war. At the same time, within the same building, the elected representatives of the people assembled in a Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies to defend and advance the interests of the revolutionary masses. In the formation of this instrument of real and potential workers' power, the Russian working class was drawing on the experience of the revolution of 1905. But while in 1905 the St. Petersburg Soviet, chaired by Leon Trotsky, emerged only in the final climactic weeks of the mass movement of the working class, the Petrograd Soviet came to life in the first week of the 1917 revolution. The class divisions within Russian society, as yet unsolved by the overthrow of the Tsarist autocracy, found expression in the regime of dual power. The existence of two rival governmental authorities, representing irreconcilably hostile class interests, was inherently unstable. Explaining the political meaning of this peculiar phenomenon, Trotsky wrote, Quote, the splitting of sovereignty foretells nothing less than a civil war. For the next eight months, the development of the revolution proceeded through the conflict between the bourgeois provisional government and the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. If the outcome of this struggle could have been determined simply on the basis of some sort of mathematical calculation of the strength of the contending forces, eight months would not have been required to settle the matter. From the start, the bourgeois provisional government was essentially powerless. Its authority depended almost entirely on the support it received from the political leaders of the Soviet, drawn principally from the Menshevik and Socialist Revolutionary Parties. They insisted that Russia's revolution was of an exclusively bourgeois democratic character, that a socialist overturn of, the cap of capitalism was not on the agenda and, therefore, that the Soviet, the representative of the working class and the mass of impoverished peasants, could not take power into its own hands. During the first weeks that followed the victorious February Revolution, the acquiescence of the Executive Committee of the Soviet went unchallenged. Even the Bolshevik Party, with Lenin still outside Russia and its leadership in the hands of 
Lev Kamenev and Joseph Stalin bowed to the executive committee's support for the provisional government and therefore the continuation of Russia's participation in the war. This line of political adaptation was to continue until Lenin returned to Russia on April 4th. Lenin's return to Russia and his arrival at the Finland station in Petrograd ranks among the most dramatic episodes in world history. The outbreak of the revolution had found him in Switzerland, living in a small second-floor apartment on Spiegelgasse in the old town section of Zurich. The circumstances of Lenin's trip from Zurich's Hauptbahnhof, a central train station, to Petrograd was to emerge as a major political issue in the course of the revolution. Under conditions of war, the possibility of a rapid return to Russia from landlocked Switzerland required that he travel through Germany. Lenin understood very well that reactionary chauvinists would raise an outcry against his decision to travel through a country that was at war with Russia. But time was of the essence. In his absence, the Bolshevik party was being drawn into the orbit of the Menshevik leaders of the Soviet who were pursuing a line of compromise with the provisional government. Lenin negotiated the conditions under which he would travel through Germany, insisting on a sealed train, precluding the possibility of any contact between himself and representatives of the German state. From the moment Lenin received news of the outbreak of revolution in Russia, he began formulating a policy of irreconcilable revolutionary opposition to the provisional government. His initial response to the revolution is recorded in a series of detailed commentaries known as the Letters from Afar. The policies Lenin advanced in the first days of the revolution were based on his analysis of the imperialist war and were a continuation of the revolutionary anti-war program for which he had fought at the Zimmerwald Conference in September 1915. There, Lenin had insisted that the imperialist war would lead to socialist revolution. The slogan he advanced, turn the imperialist war into a civil war, was a programmatic concretization of this perspective. Lenin saw the overthrow of the Tsarist autocracy as a confirmation of his analysis. The upheaval in Russia was not a self-contained national event, but the first stage of the uprising of the European working class against imperialist war and therefore the beginning of the Socialist Revolution. Lenin's analysis of Russian events within the international framework of the World War placed him in conflict not only with the Menshevik leaders of the Soviet, but also with substantial sections of the Bolshevik party leadership in Petrograd. The Menshevik leaders argued that with the overthrow of the Tsar, the political character of Russia's participation in the war had changed. The war had now become a legitimate democratic war of national self-defense. The initial response of the Bolshevik party, formulated by lower-level leaders of the Petrograd organization, was to reaffirm the intransigent anti-war stance for which Lenin had fought for at Zimmerwald, reiterating his call to turn the imperialist war into a civil war. But as more senior leaders made their way from Siberian exile to Petrograd, the political line of the party changed. The arrival of Kamenev and Stalin in Petrograd in mid-March led almost immediately to a dramatic shift in policy, adopting a defensist position that justified the continuation of the war. Kamenev, with Stalin's support, published a statement in the Bolshevik organ Pravda on March 15th which declared, quote, When army stands against army, it would be the blindest of all policies which called upon one of them to lay down its arms and go home. A free people will staunchly remain at its post, answering bullet for bullet. End of quote. Sukhanov has left behind a vivid description of Lenin's return to Russia. The Bolshevik party organized a rousing welcome for their returning leader. The Soviet leaders, recognizing that Lenin's years of revolutionary activity had earned him immense prestige among the advanced workers of Petrograd, 
felt obligated to join the official welcoming party. Lennon descended from the train and was handed a magnificent bouquet of red roses, which contrasted somewhat oddly with his entirely conventional attire. Clearly delighted to have arrived into the capital of the revolution, Lenin rapidly made his way into the waiting room of the Finland station. There he encountered a glum delegation of Soviet leaders, led by its chairman, the Georgian-born Menshevik Nikolai Shehidze. A smile frozen on his face, the nervous chairman gave a, an official welcome which consisted of appealing to Lenin to avoid disrupting the unity of the left. Lenin, Sukhanov recalled, seemed to pay scant attention to the Soviet chairman's oration, as if it had nothing to do with him. Lenin gazed at the ceiling, surveyed the audience for familiar faces, and adjusted the flowers of the bouquet he was still holding in his hand. As soon as Shahidza concluded his somber remarks, Lenin began hurling his thunderbolts. Quote, Dear soldiers, comrades, sailors, and workers, I am happy to greet you in your persons, the victorious Russian Revolution, and greet you as the vanguard of the worldwide proletarian army. The piratical imperialist war is the beginning of civil war throughout Europe. The hour is not far distant when at the call of our comrade, Karl Liebknecht, the peoples will turn their arms against their own capitalist exploiters. The worldwide socialist revolution has already dawned. Germany is seething. Any date now, the whole of European capitalism may crash. The Russian Revolution accomplished by you has prepared the way and opened a new epoch. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution. End of quote. Sukhanov records the stunning impact of Lenin's words. Quote, it was all very interesting. Suddenly, before the eyes of all of us, Completely swallowed up by the routine drudgery of the revolution, there was presented a bright, blinding, exotic beacon, obliterating, obliterating everything we lived by. Lenin's voice, heard straight from the train, was a voice from outside. There had broken in upon us in the revolution a note that was not, to be sure, a contradiction, but that was novel, harsh, and somewhat deafening. End of quote. Recalling his own reaction to Lenin's words, Sukhanov acknowledged that he felt that, quote, Lenin was right a thousand times over in recognizing the beginning of the worldwide socialist revolution and establishing an unbreakable connection between the world war and the crash of the imperialist system. End of quote. But Sukhanov, who epitomized the political ambivalence that characterized, characterized even the most left-wing elements among the Mensheviks saw no possibility of translating Lenin's perspective, however correct, into practical revolutionary action. Lenin proceeded from the reception at the Finland station to a brief dinner with his old comrades and then to a meeting where, in the course of an informal report that lasted about two hours, he provided an outline of what would, in its developed form, enter into history as the April Theses. Lenin explained that the democratic revolution could only be defended and completed on the basis of a socialist revolution, requiring the repudiation of the imperialist war, the overthrow of the bourgeois provisional government, and the transfer of state power to the Soviets. Sukhanov, who had managed to gain admission to the meeting, even though he was not a member of the Bolshevik party, described the report. Quote, I don't think that Lenin, barely out of his sealed train, expected to expound in his answer his whole credo and all his program and tactics in the World Socialist Revolution. This speech was probably largely an improvisation and so lacked any special density or worked out plan. But each individual part of the speech, each element, each idea was excellently worked out. It was clear that these ideas had long wholly occupied Lenin and had been defended by him more than once. This was shown by the astonishing wealth of vocabulary, the whole dazzling cascade of definitions, nuances, and parallel explanatory ideas, 
which can be attained only through fundamental brain work. Lenin began, of course, with the worldwide socialist revolution that was ready to explode as a result of the world war. The crisis of imperialism expressed in the war could be resolved only by socialism. The imperialist war could not help but turn into a civil war and could be indeed ended only by a civil war, by a worldwide socialist revolution. Lenin's political program, which signaled the alignment of his strategy with Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, was not based primarily on an appraisal of nationally determined circumstances and opportunities as they existed in Russia. The essential question confronting the working class was not whether Russia, as a national state, had achieved a sufficient level of capitalist development that would allow the transition to socialism. Rather, the Russian working class confronted a historical situation in which its own fate was inextricably bound up with the struggle of the European working class against the imperialist war and the capitalist system from which it arose. Once Lenin had overcome resistance within his own party, the Bolsheviks were able to develop the struggle against the political influence of the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries. These efforts were vastly strengthened by Trotsky's return in May. His arrival in Petrograd had been delayed because the British authorities in Halifax, Canada, had taken Trotsky off the boat traveling from New York to Russia, interning him in a prisoner of war camp for one month. Protests in Russia against Trotsky's illegal seizure compelled the provisional government to, to demand that the British release him. But neither the provisional government nor the Soviet leaders were pleased to learn of Trotsky's arrival. Few harbored hopes that he would prove to be a restraining influence on the growing radicalization of the working class. Sukhanov recalled indefinite rumors were circulating about him while he was still outside the Bolshevik party to the effect that he was worse than Lenin. Now that the earlier differences with Lenin had been resolved, Trotsky entered the Bolshevik party where he immediately assumed a leading role, second only to Lenin. Many of Trotsky's closest political allies, active in the Petrograd interdistrict group, the so-called Mezrayonsi, followed his lead, joining the Bolsheviks, and went on to play major roles in the October Revolution, the Civil War, and the Soviet government. Of course, Stalin ultimately murdered most of these outstanding rev representatives of the Mezrayonsi, who had survived into the 1930s. The provisional government could fulfill none of the hopes aroused by the February Revolution. Unwilling to sacrifice its own imperialist ambitions and dependent upon the support of British, French, and American imperialism, the provisional government refused to end the war. In defiance of the sentiment of the masses, the Kerensky government launched an offensive operation in June that ended in disaster. The agitation of the Bolshevik party, demanding that the Soviet leaders break with the provisional government and take power into their own hands, met with growing support. As the prestige of the Bolshevik party grew, the efforts of the provisional government, the capitalist press, and leading Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries to blackguard and discredit Lenin became ever more frenzied. The suppression of mass anti-government demonstrations the so-called July Days, was followed by a ferocious campaign against the Bolshevik party and especially against Lenin. The fact that he had traveled through Germany to return to Russia was seized upon to fuel a slander campaign aimed at preparing the necessary political conditions for Lenin's assassination. <clears throat> the provisional government ordered Lenin's arrest on July 7th, understanding very well that his captors would murder him before he even made it to the prison. Lenin went into hiding. During the next two months, during his enforced absence from Petrograd, he wrote State and Revolution. He prefaced the book with an explanation. Quote, The question of the state is now acquiring particular importance 
both in theory and practical politics. The imperialist war has immensely accelerated and intensified the process of transformation of monopoly capital into state monopoly capitalism. The unprecedented horrors and miseries of the protracted war are making the people's position unbearable and increasing their anger. The world proletarian revolution is clearly maturing. The question of its relation to the state is acquiring practical importance. End of quote. In this remarkable work, Lenin carried out what he referred to as an exercise in historical excavation, reestablishing the teachings of Marx and Engels on the nature of the state as an instrument of class rule for the maintenance of the power and the domination of one class over another. The very existence of the state arose out of the existence and irreconcilability of class antagonisms. Lenin attacked bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideologies who correct Marx in such a way as to make it appear that the state is an organ for the reconciliation of classes. Lenin considered state and revolution to be of the greatest importance and specifically instructed that in the event of his untimely death, special attention was to be given to its publication. But Lenin survived. By September, the political situation began to shift radically to the left, Confronted with the threat of a counter-revolutionary coup by General Kornilov, the Soviet leaders were compelled to mobilize and arm the masses. Trotsky, who had been in prison since July, was released. In the face of mass working-class resistance, in whose organization the Bolsheviks played a critical role, Kornilov's soldiers deserted the general, and the attempted coup collapsed. Kerensky who had been secretly conspiring with Kornilov in advance of the coup, was politically discredited. With Lenin still in hiding, the Bolshevik party, advancing the slogan of all power to the Soviets, experienced a massive surge in popular support. Broad section of the working class deserted to the Mensheviks, who still refused to break with the provisional government, excuse me, deserted the Mensheviks, who still refused to break with the provisional government, and sanction the transfer of state power to the Soviets. In September, with the economic and political crisis intensifying and with general uprising spreading throughout the countryside, Lenin called for, upon the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party to begin concrete preparations for the organization of an insurrection to seize power. On October 10th, Lenin slipped into Petrograd to attend a meeting of the Central Committee, which passed a resolution in support of an insurrection. However, there remained substantial opposition within the party to actually attempting the overthrow of the provisional government, as well as disagreement over the formulation of a strategic plan for the insurrection. A detailed review of the Bolshevik insur insurrection is not possible within the scope of this lecture. It would require a careful examination of the significant differences that arose within the Bolshevik leadership in the days leading up to the seizure of power. Len Trotsky's Lessons of October and, of course, his History of the Russian Revolution provide accounts of the conflict within the Bolshevik party and their political and historical significance, which remain unsurpassed in their comprehension of the interaction of objective and subjective elements in the revolutionary process. However, there is one critical issue relating to the October Revolution that must be addressed. The claim that the overthrow of the provisional government in October was a conspiratorial putsch, undertaken without any substantial popular support, has been repeated endlessly and recycled in countless variations by political opponents of the Bolsheviks and reactionary historians for an entire century. None other than Kerensky, who lived until 1970, and thus, one might say, survived himself by more than a half century, continued to insist until his death at the age of 89 that his government had fallen victim to a nefarious and criminal conspiracy. 
The denigration of the October Revolution as a coup, lacking popular support, has been refuted by numerous scholarly studies, of which the works of the American historian Alexander Rabinovich are the most comprehensive and impressive. In his preface to The Bolsheviks in Power, published in 2007, as the third volume of his lifelong study of the Russian Revolution, Professor Rabinovich wrote, and I quote, The Bolsheviks come to power together with prelude to revolution, challenged prevailing Western notions of the October Revolution as no more than a military coup by a small, united band of revolutionary fanatics, brilliantly led by Lenin. I found that in 1917, the Bolshevik party in Petrograd transformed itself into a mass political party, and that, rather than being a monolithic movement marching in lockstep behind Lenin, its leadership was divided into left, centrist, and moderate right wings, each of which helped shape revolutionary strategy and tactics. I also found that the party's success in the struggle for power after the overthrow of the Tsar in February 1917 was due, in critically important ways, to its organizational flexibility, openness, and responsiveness to popular aspirations, as well as to its extensive, carefully nurtured connections to factory workers, soldiers of the Petrograd garrison, and Baltic fleet sailors. The October Revolution in Petrograd, I concluded, was less a military operation than a gradual process rooted in popular political culture, widespread disenchantment with the results of the February Revolution, and in that context, the magnetic attraction of the Bolsheviks' promises of immediate peace, bread, land for the peasantry, and grassroots democracy exercised through multi-party Soviets. End of quote. Professor Rabinovich grew up in a family that had close personal connections with Menshevik leaders. He was personally acquainted with Iraqi Tseretelli, the leader of the Menshevik faction in the Petrograd Soviet. He heard the Menshevik side of the story many times. But his own scientific research led Professor Rabinovich to conclusions that contradicted the explanations given by the Mensheviks for their defeat in 1917. In the immediate aftermath of the October Revolution, neither the Russian nor international bourgeoisie clearly understood the political magnitude of the events in Petrograd. The ruling elites reacted as if the Bolshevik victory were a nightmare from which they would soon awaken. On November 9th, Washington time, less than 48 hours after the overthrow of the provisional government, the New York Times reported that, quote, Washington and embassy officials expect Bolsheviki rule to be short, unquote. The Times dispatch assured its readers, and I quote, The Russian situation is believed to be not as dark as news dispatches from Petrograd would indicate. Officials of the State Department and the Russian embassy agree in the opinion that the present control of the Petrograd government by the Bolsheviki Revolutionary Military Committee cannot last. One high official said today that he was of the view that the outcome might have a good effect rather than otherwise, because it afforded the opportunity of some strong man rising to take control of the situation. End of quote. But the strong man expected by the administration of President Woodrow Wilson did not arise. And within a week, the optimistic confidence that the revolution would be quickly drowned in blood gave way to rage. In an editorial published on November 16th entitled The Bolsheviki, the Times denounced Kerensky for paltering as trifling with the revolutionaries and for not having backed sufficiently a Cornel of coup. Seething with hatred, the editorial continued and every precious word deserves to be quoted. Yet, though Kerensky has failed, someone else may arise, strong enough to take the government out of the destructive hands of the Bolsheviki. Indeed, retain it permanently they cannot, for they are pathetically ignorant, shallow men, political children, without the slightest understanding of the vast forces they are playing with, men without a single 
qualification for prominence, but the gift of gab. And if they could be let alone long enough, their mere incompetence would destroy them, though perhaps only to replace them with others as bad. Such was the history of the French Revolution, a kaleidoscope of government by said after said of silver-tongued incompetence and ignoramuses, each worse than the other, until incompetence and ignorance destroyed themselves altogether. End of quote. Who were the ignoramuses? And what had the Bolsheviks done during the hours and days following the overthrow of the provisional government to incite the wrath of the New York Times and the forces of international capitalist imperialism for which it spoke? First, the Bolsheviks issued a decree on peace, calling on all the warring parties to begin negotiations to end the war without annexations and indemnities. Second, the new Soviet government had issued a decree on land, declaring that, quote, private ownership of land shall be abolished forever. Land shall not be purchased, sold, leased, mortgaged, or otherwise alienated, end of quote. Thus began the greatest social revolution in world history. There had been other revolutions. The English Revolution of 1640 to 49, the American Revolution of 1776 to 83, the French Revolution of 1789 to 94, and the Second American Revolution of 1861 to 65. That none of these realized, or even came close to realizing, the ideals they proclaimed does not detract from their significance as milestones in the historical development of mankind. There is nothing as intellectually repulsive as the efforts of the postmodernists to discredit the sacrifices of past generations in pursuit of a better world. With such exercises in petty bourgeois cynicism, Marxian socialists have no sympathy whatsoever. While recognizing the historically determined limitations of the efforts of the revolutionists of earlier historical epochs, we pay them the tribute that is their due. But as an event in world history, the Russian Revolution represents the highest and as yet unsurpassed effort of humanity to identify the causes of injustice and human suffering and put an end to them. The October Revolution achieved an unprecedented alignment of human consciousness with objective necessity. This found expression not only in the decisions and actions of its political leaders. To see the events of October only in terms of the actions of leaders, even the greatest of them, is to miss the significance of the revolution. In a revolution, it is the masses who make history. In overthrowing the provisional government, the working class acted with profound awareness of the laws of socio-economic development. Thoughts are scientific, wrote Trotsky, if they correspond to an objective process and make it possible to influence that process and guide it. In this fundamental sense, the thoughts and practice of millions of people in 1917 rose to the level of science. Scientific theory gripped the masses and was transformed into a material force. The working class set about to abolish an archaic system of socioeconomic relations and the anarchy of the capitalist market and introduced conscious planning into the organization of economic life. In the 1920s and 1930s, when there, still ex- when there still existed an American intelligentsia committed to democratic principles and capable <coughs> of adopting a critical attitude toward capitalist society, the historical significance of what was then called the Soviet experiment was widely recognized. In 1931, the American liberal philosopher John Dewey wrote a review for the New Republic of several books about the Soviet Union. Dewey noted that, quote, 
Russia is a challenge to America, not because of this or that characteristic, but because we have no social machinery for controlling the technological machinery to which we have committed our fortunes." Unquote. And he expressed sympathy for the Marxist proposition that, quote, social phenomena are capable of being controlled so that the development of human society can be, can be made subject to the human will, end of quote. Dewey proceeded to express sympathy with the critique of capitalism presented in The Soviet Challenge to America, a book written by a prominent liberal of the day, George S. Counts. And he quoted from the book. Industrial society in its present form is a monster possessing neither soul nor inner significance. It has succeeded in destroying the simpler cultures of the past, but has failed to produce a culture of its own, worthy of the name. Whether this state of moral chaos is the temporary maladjustment of a transition epoch or the inevitable product of a society organized for private gain is one of the most crucial questions of our time." End of quote. The fate of the Russian Revolution from the October Revolution of 1917 to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 is the most significant and complex historical experience of the 20th century. But the problems with which it grappled not only persist, they are more acute than ever. 100 years after the Russian Revolution of 1917, capitalism is spiraling toward disaster. The crisis of capitalist society is clearly not simply, as Professor Counts put it 85 years ago, the temporary maladjustment of a transition epoch. The existence of this historically obsolete form of economic organization, based on private ownership of mankind's productive forces and natural resources, brutally exploiting the great mass of humanity in the interest of pro corporate profit, and private wealth is not only the principal barrier to human progress. Capitalism's existence is rapidly becoming incompatible with the maintenance of human life. There is not a single significant social problem that can be solved within the framework of capitalism. Indeed, the logic of capitalism and its nation-state system which forms the basis of imperialist geopolitics, is leading inexorably to yet another global war, this time fought with nuclear weapons. Nothing can stop the descent into disaster but the renewal of the conscious struggle for world socialism. And this, above all, is why it is necessary to study and learn from the Russian Revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that fascinating and comprehensive lecture. We will now open the meeting up to questions, and we already have a number that have come in online. We'll try to get to as many as possible. As I mentioned before, you can submit your questions through Discus underneath the YouTube stream, or send them to sep at socialistequality.com, sep at socialistequality.com. Before we begin the questions, I would like to encourage everyone listening now to take, take, make the decision to join and become involved with the International Committee of the Fourth International. There's a, a link below the web page to find out more information about joining the SEP in your country. Also, if you have not registered, please do so now to get updates and more information on subsequent lectures in this series. I would also like to take a moment to ask everyone listening to assist in bringing this essential political history and knowledge to the international working class. We need your financial support to sustain and develop the World Socialist website. Online events like this require technical and logistical resources. We must expand our on-the-spot <laughs> reporting, video journalism, and multi-language translations. Please take a moment, click the link on the web page, and make a donation to the WSWS, or you can donate directly at wsws.org donate. As I noted at the beginning, 
Several of Comrade North's books are available at Maring Books for a special discounted rate today. I would particularly urge our listeners to order The Russian Revolution and the Unfinished 20th Century, which is essential reading and understanding the revolutionary events of 100 years ago and the central political and theoretical issues that have been fought out throughout the last century. So with that, we'll begin with the first question. Uh, we have a question from Maxwell. Uh, he writes, Hello, uh, as I conclude from your presentation, the outbreak of the Russian Revolution was linked to the horrors of the First Imperialist World War. How can an outbreak of a Third World War be prevented uh, in these days? As the war preparations today are at a staggering pace, and a Third World War would likely be fought with nuclear weapons, how much time is left for a revolutionary movement to start. I hope that this time in history there won't be an outbreak of a third world war before the outbreak of a new socialist revolution. Well, clearly that's a question of great importance. What first must be said is that uh, the most critical task of the socialist movement today is to prevent the outbreak of war to do everything it can to make impossible the launching of a world war and to use those wars that have already begun and which are raging throughout the world as lessons and uh, to explain the significance of these developments of these local uh, eruptions of imperialist violence so that the working class on an international scale can gather its strength and create a movement of such power that can defeat and indeed overthrow the bourgeoisie before they plunge the entire planet into a catastrophe. Now the important point to understand in trying to recognize or trying to understand whether this is possible is that the very contradictions that give rise to world war are the same contradictions which are creating the possibility of socialist revolution. I want to stress this does not mean that first you must have world war and then you will get a social revolution. No, that the contradictions are creating, on the one hand, the violent eruptions of imperialist violence, and at the same time, they are intensifying social and class contradictions in every part of the world. The critical challenge is to develop within these mounting struggles an ever greater level of political and social consciousness, to build the Marxist movement, to overcome the influence of political forces, of the bourgeoisie, of petty bourgeois pseudo-left forces, of which there are many, who do everything possible to try to block the development of a genuine Marxist movement of the working class. I recently came across an article by one such organization, one such petty bourgeois group, which proudly proclaimed that it's necessary to build a movement without vanguardist pretensions, which is another way of saying uh, that uh, it does not take itself seriously, that it has no intention of building a movement of the working class with a genuine Marxist leadership. Uh, the whole experience of the Russian Revolution, as I tried to stress in my remarks, was that it would never have led to the conquest of power by the working class without the long, long struggle to educate the working class, to develop a Marxist party. And uh, so we must draw from that lesson that the most critical question today is not to wait passively and see how developments unfold, but to do everything now to unify the many different forms of social and political struggle of the working class all over the world against unemployment, against the high cost of living, against the relentless deterioration of social conditions, against the approach of war, the brutal assault on the democratic rights of immigrant workers to unite all these different forms of struggle into a concentrated 
international political movement against the capitalist system. Well, a number of uh, readers have asked questions relating to the present political situation, and certainly one of the points that you were stressing is the relationship between the events 100 years ago and the current capitalist crisis. I'd perhaps return to that a bit later. Uh, there is one question, though, uh, which relates more to the content uh, of your lecture uh, on the Russian Revolution. Joe from Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, in the U.S., writes, could you talk more about what the Soviets were and why they were important in the course of the revolution? Well, the Soviets, and the Soviet is the Russian word for council, the, the, the Soviets, of course, had their roots in the experience of the 1905 revolution. Uh, they first emerged, I believe, in October 1905, at a very advanced stage of the political movement of the working class, which had been building throughout 1905 since the massacre that had occurred in January 1905, the notorious Bloody Sunday, in which the Tsar's troops mowed down uh, scores of working workers in front of the Winter Palace. The Soviets emerged, and they rapidly established themselves as a genuine democratic instrument of incipient workers' power. The first Soviet was chaired by Leon Trotsky, and it was under the aegis of the Soviet that a great general strike unfolded. It was suppressed in 1905 uh, with the suppression of the Russian Revolution of that year. Now, 12 years later, this experience still lived in the working class, and it is remarkable that on February 27th, the day the Tsarist regime fell, socialists issued a call for Soviets again. It was immediately taken up by workers throughout Petrograd, and within 12 hours, uh, over a thousand representatives elected from factories and communities in Petrograd, uh, delegates were elected and they formed these Soviets. One should also point out that similar organizations were springing up throughout Russia. So this was actually a national movement, but the most important Soviet was in Petrograd. The significance of the Soviets were, and later on Lenin would talk of their universal significance, is that it represented a new form of state based on the working class, entirely different in character from bourgeois parliaments, or our Congress in the United States, bought and sold by the rich, and that's of course the rule in every part of the world. It was a form of organization which sprang up directly, direct elections from the working class, which represented class interests. And in the course of 1917, uh, the real political struggle that reflected the growth of consciousness and the change in consciousness of the working class was within the Soviets. There was constant election of deputies from among the soldiers, among the sailors, in working class factories. Tendencies were changing. Uh, in the course of several months, as the experience of Menshevik policies increasingly alienated ever broader sections of the working class, the influence of the work of the Bolsheviks in the Soviets became increasingly significant. And so as a hist their role in October was, was immense, of course the Bolshevik Revolution itself, the Bolshevik insurrection took place under conditions in which the Soviets were assembling. I didn't go into this in this lecture, this will be taken up in a later series of lectures, there was uh, a question, a serious issue within the Bolshevik party of uh, the actual role that would be, would be played by the Soviets in uh, the insurrection itself. <clears throat> it was Trotsky who fought for the position that the seizure of power, the insurrection organized by the Bolshevik party should take place with the authority 
of the Soviets, and in fact, the events of October 24th, 25th, or November 6th, 7th, took place against the backdrop of the assembling of the Second Congress of the Soviets, uh, which ratified the seizure of power by the Bolshevik Party. Lenin conceived of the Soviets at that time as the real democratic foundation of the working class revolution, uh, the, as he would later write, the form of rule beyond bourgeois parliamentarism discovered by the working class in the course of revolutionary struggle. And I think to this day it must remain a model for revolutionary socialists uh, in encouraging, in opposition to bourgeois parliamentarism, uh, forms of organization that directly reflect and express the interests of the working class. Real forum where the great political issues can be fought out within the working class and uh, the working class can, through democratic decision, arrive at its uh, understanding of the need for socialist revolution and implement it, and then such organizations should become the basis of a new, genuinely democratic state power. And to be consistent with Lenin, to create the conditions ultimately for the withering away of the state. Well, this uh, relates to, or perhaps leads into questions from a number of readers related to the subsequent development uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, one reader, Will, uh, asks, uh, if socialism means complete worker control of the factory, how do the events of October 1917 support and or undermine the concept of socialism? Were the Soviets destroyed? And if so, why was this necessary? And then another reader or listener, Dan, uh, <coughs> writes, my understanding of a worker's state is that workers own, operate, and manage the means of production. Such an organization of production entails that the means of production and all decision-making relevant to it rests directly in the hands of the workers where production occurs. Isn't this what Marx intended? In the USSR, decision-making was centralized. Can the USSR therefore accurately be considered to have been a workers' state if the workers themselves did not make the decisions about what to produce, where to produce, how to produce, and what to do with the fruits of surplus labor? Well, of course, any discussion of the evolution of the Soviet Union uh, which is, of course, an immense and critical historical question, must recognize the conditions which existed in the aftermath of the seizure of power. In explaining, and we're really uh, talking about the process of historical degeneration of the revolution, which undoubtedly took place, and of course the Trotskyist movement itself emerged in a struggle against this degeneration which found expression politically in the usurpation of power by a state bureaucracy uh, led by Stalin. Trotsky emphasized three conditions which led to this. First, uh, the enormous or tragic legacy of economic backwardness which the Bolshevik revolution inherited from Tsarism. Russia was not the most advanced, it was among the most backward of major capitalist states with a relatively small working class and a vast peasantry. It was for this very reason that the Bolsheviks Lenin, Trotsky, always insisted that the possibility of developing socialism in the Soviet Union uh, depended upon the expansion of the socialist revolution into the more advanced countries of Europe, North America. Now, <clears throat> There was an explosion of revolution, the most significant being the eruption of revolution in Germany 
just one year later, in November 1918, that revolution was drowned in blood, and the, Bolsh- the, the bourgeoisie had already learned the lessons of October 1917. They murdered the revolutionaries. Luxembourg and Liebknecht were assassinated in January 1919. But the point that must be stressed is that the defeats of the revolution beyond the borders of the Soviet Union left the Soviet Union isolated. Uh, This, of course, this isolation, as well as the economic backwardness, was compounded by the horrifying consequences of the civil war that followed the revolution, a civil war in which all the major imperialist powers intervened. The United States sent forces to crush the Bolshevik government, the French, the British, the Japanese, the Italians, the Czechs. There was a massive imperialist intervention. So the combined impact of these events and circumstances, economic backwardness, the defeat of revolution beyond the borders of the Soviet Union, the isolation of the USSR, all of these created conditions in which uh, the uh, Soviet state underwent a degeneration. Uh, It was not in any event, to be frank, possible to uh, even begin socialist construction without some form of centralized government. You could not have fought a civil war. And in this, the uh, Bolsheviks, of course, disagreed with their many anarchist uh, critics. Uh, And I think the experience of, of the civil war and anyone who understands anything about the complexity of war the complexity of economic organization would understand uh, that uh, in that period uh, centralization was of immense significance. But the possibility of advancing toward democratic planning, the possibility of developing genuine working class democracy was fatally undermined uh, by a whole set of objective conditions then compounded by the actual impact of the degeneration of the Bolshevik party itself. That's a, a long and complicated uh, historical question. Of course, it, the, the explanation of that issue uh, lies at the very foundations of the Trotskyist movement. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, many readers have, or listeners, have written in about the present political situation, as I, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I can't read them all. I'll give a sampling, and uh, perhaps you can address some of the issues that those listening are are raising. Uh, One listener commented uh, on the stream. He said, what historic lessons did the working class draw from global Trumpism, the populist form of bourgeois reaction in the U.S. and Europe? Jackie writes, what are the parallels that you see between the Russian Revolution and what is happening in current politics? Uh, J.S. writes, uh, it took starvation for the Russian working class <coughs> to revolt. Do you anticipate things having to get that bad today? Uh, another listener r- wrote, you said that the major gains for workers in the 20th century were products of the Russian Revolution. How and why are these gains, for instance, Medicaid being lost? Medicaid uh, referring to the health care program uh, in the United States. Uh, perhaps you could speak about some of the issues that are, are being raised by these listeners. Again, these are all very good questions. Uh, we made the point a number of times in discussions about the political situation. The Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, and uh, perhaps some of our listeners, I don't know, I suppose we have a fair mixture of age groups, but those who are a bit older, uh, will recall that when the Soviet Union was dissolved, we heard from all and sundry, particularly among the academic community, that a new age had dawned. It was Professor, uh, or the, or the, not actually Professor, but Fukuyama, who, um, Francis Fukuyama, who said that uh, we had arrived at the end of history. 
And in one form or another, that uh, viewpoint was sustained. And his idea was that the end of the USSR, and of course he provided no significant and serious explanation for the whole course of Soviet history. After all, the Soviet Union wasn't dissolved, it didn't collapse after six months, it didn't collapse after seven years, it was dissolved after 74 years. That's a very substantial period of history. A lot of things happened. If I may just somewhat interrupt the stream of my argument, if one examines any revolution, one knows, of course, that they have uh, complex histories. Even Lincoln, when he spoke at Gettysburg, called attention to the fact that 87 years had passed since 1776, and after 87 years, the question was raised, would that form of state formed in on the basis of 70, 1776, would that state survive? I want to give many such examples. You know, this is also the, this year is also the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which began in 1517. And I think there would even be respected theologians who would agree uh, that the uh, religious community still has many problems unsolved in its own various denominations. And certainly the paradise which was promised never materialized. The English Revolution was followed by the restoration of a king. After the French Revolution came Napoleon, and liberty, fraternity, and equality was never realized in a capitalist context. And now we come to the question of global Trumpism. I mean, how is it possible? I mean, if the theories of those who said that history had ended, capitalism had triumphed, and a new age of democracy had arrived, then how is it possible that after 25 years, we see everywhere such a state of social, political, economic squalor. I mean, there's a myth that uh, the ghost of Lincoln still wanders through the White House. Well, I think if that ghost is wandering through the White House, it will be frightened out of its wits if it bumps into Donald Trump. How did this happen? And why do we see, after so many years, the emergence, I don't think it's necessary for me to convince this audience, that in the person of Donald Trump, one has something particularly ugly and disgusting, something which embodies all that is backward in American society, and of course, all that is repulsive, all the repulsive characteristics of the American ruling class finds its uh, epitome in this figure. But remember, it's not just happening in the United States. All over the world we see this apparent drift to the extreme right. How is this possible? Well, history teaches us that the growth of political reaction is the expression of suppressed social contradictions. If the ruling class had a positive and progressive response to the social and economic problems of our time, such individuals would not be rising to power. They wouldn't have a Le Pen gaining strength in France. They wouldn't have UKIP in Britain. They wouldn't have the revival of militarism in Germany. They wouldn't have a Duterte, an organizer of death squads in the Philippines. Something is profoundly sick, and those who understand that political conditions must be explained from economic conditions will establish the link between the deep crisis of capitalist society and the present political situation. The ruling elites had 25 years to show us what they could do without any supposed threat in any way from socialism. But what we have are disasters, endless wars, which demonstrates that the problems of capitalism are not the product of 
evil conspiracies launched by socialist agitators, as police would claim. Rather, it comes organically from the contradictions of a system based on private ownership of the means of production, and to which we must add a completely archaic national state system. We live in an age of global economy, economic integration. These advanced forms of economic integration, accelerated by the technological revolution, are incompatible with the nation state system. And so this reactionary movement toward protectionism, toward the witch hunt of refugees, the building of walls, and so on, all of this demonstrates that this is a system which has lived itself. The solution it poses or proposes to the problems of our time are reactionary, destructive, and the conceptions of Marxism. The ending of private ownership of the means of production. The transfer of social wealth to the people. The abolition of the national state system. These are in fact the only realistic solutions to the problems of our time. And all the horrors which one sees uh, are proof that the implementation of the solution must not be postponed. Again, as to the question of the many advances of the working class in the 20th century being byproducts of the social revolution, I think that's undoubtedly the case. The world was changed by the Russian Revolution. It established the possibility and the reality of an alternative. It didn't solve all the problems. It could not, because the problems could only be solved on a world scale. But it showed that under certain conditions, given the presence of a highly conscious mass movement, given the presence of a Marxist leadership, which had prepared over an extended period of time, and of course, when I use the term extended, all such terms are relative. But it was possible to take power. And I want to add again that the Russian Revolution was not the only revolutionary movement that existed. It was not only in Petrograd in 1917 that a revolutionary movement of the masses emerged. There were other revolutionary movements in Spain in the 1930s in Germany prior to 1933, in France in the mid-1930s, in post-war Europe in the 1940s, even into the 1960s. In 1968, a general strike of 10 million workers, which erupted more or less spontaneously, and the red flag going up on factories throughout Paris. Some of us can remember those days. The extraordinary social movement in Chile in the early 1970s. But what was absent in all these events, for a complex set of reasons, and we sum them up by referring to the crisis of leadership, the perfidious role of Stalinism, of social democracy. In none of these other movements did there exist a leadership comparable to that which existed in Petrograd in 1917, and that was the decisive difference. That's the major lesson that must be learned from 1917 as we seek to respond to the uh, great crisis of our own time. Well, I'm being asked if we can take, we'll probably have time for one more set of questions because we must, uh, we have, I understand, just 10 minutes left on this feed. Okay. I, think, I think we have time for one more. Uh, I want to ask this one. Uh, the listener uh, raises it as, as a personal question, but I think it uh, addresses or raises broader political uh, issues. He writes, I always hope to hear something personal. I hope Mr. North will mention what it was about the Russian Revolution that particularly drew his own interest in it. Um, obviously, you've spent a great amount of your political work has been devoted to explaining 
fighting out historical issues in, in books such as The Russian Revolution and the Unfinished 20th Century, uh, the, uh, in defense of Leon Trotsky, countless lectures. Perhaps you could explain what it was uh, that, why it is that you focus so much attention on these historical questions. And, what, and as the reader said, what is it that drew you to these historical questions? Well, I think when, I think one comes to understand at a certain point in one's political development, especially if one is living through a period of crisis, that if one wants to understand the circumstances one faces, one requires historical reference points. One has to work over the historical experience which created the situation that an existing, a new generation faces. Of course, my generation came into political activity in the, in the aftermath of the Second World War and uh, in the course of the great upheavals of the American Civil Rights Movement, the war in Vietnam. And one had an opportunity to see the, first of all, the total incapacity of American liberalism to deal seriously or even honestly with any of these problems. The question of socialism more and more began to emerge, especially as the uh, uh, struggles of uh, the working class uh, internationally still were of considerable power. There was great confusion uh, created by the character of the Communist parties. Of course, the Soviet Union by that point could not be seen as a real example of a socialist society. But one was aware that a revolution had taken place and so one wanted to understand what had happened to that revolution. And so, since you want a personal, the, the, the question asked for a personal experience, I was, like many other uh, representatives of my generation, uh, profoundly influenced by an encounter with the works of Leon Trotsky. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, the uh, trilogy of Isaac Deutscher, uh, the biography of Trotsky had an enormous impact on countering the endless lies about Trotsky that had been told by the Stalinists, promoted by the Soviet bureaucracy, you know, told in even more ludicrous forms by the anarchists, by the Maoists. And one came to realize through a study of Trotsky's writings that this constituted the greatest and most profound explanation of the Russian Revolution, the fate of the Russian Revolution. There was, if I may use the term, a certain timelessness in Trotsky's writings. Of all the great Marxists, he remained the most immediately and directly relevant. And he spoke in a language and of conditions which were so astonishingly relevant to the experiences through which one was passing. And I must say, after more than uh, 46 years of activity in the revolutionary movement, that remains true to this day. There is nothing more concise and nothing more uh, relevant to our period in the writings of Trotsky. And I must add, and in preparing uh, these lectures, I had the very pleasurable experience of reworking and rereading Lenin's writings. And one is astonished by the contemporary character of his writings, his analysis. And I will conclude with this. I made this point in other lectures I've given, but I feel this more strongly now than at any time. And I believe those who study the Russian revolutionary experience seriously will agree or come to the same conclusions. For all that has changed, for the vast developments in technology, the vast changes in many forms of social life, the political language of our time is still the political language of 1917. The one great difference is, I will exempt the World Socialist website from this criticism, The great language of classical Marxism, which Lenin, Trotsky, the Bolsheviks, Luxembourg, Liebknecht spoke, that was abandoned. 
by much of what calls itself the left. And in all the many decades in which they promised to go beyond Marxism, to teach us something new, what has they come up with? Nothing. Not a single significant work which has gone beyond, let alone refuted Marxism. And so for an understanding of the present world and to develop an analysis of present situations and a strategy for socialist revolution, there is no better foundation than the works of Marx and Engels and of Lenin and Trotsky. So I hope that uh, today's lecture and I'm sure the lectures that follow over the next several weeks will, encour will encourage and should encourage uh, our listeners uh, to undertake for themselves a serious study of Marxist literature, follow each day uh, the uh, analysis being made by the World Socialist website of contemporary events. We're often asked, how do we manage to put out a website day after day? Well, we can do it because we are working with a fantastic political capital left to us by the great masters of classical Marxism. And we're very pleased that this uh, work is being followed by an ever larger audience all over the world. Well, thank you, Comrade David North, again for your report and the discussion. And I want to thank everyone who's participated today from countries all over the world. Uh, just to the last point that you made about uh, the works of Lenin and Trotsky, many of these are available on, on Maring Books. And we're also offering, as a special offering to listeners today and over the next 48 hours, we're discounting the works of and the writings of, of Comrade North. Uh, no, you're not discounting them. I hope you're selling them for less, but don't <laughs> discount them. Not, not discounting them politically, <laughs> discounting them in price. Uh, we're especially recommending a bundle uh, of the Russian Revolution and the Unfinished 20th Century, together with a cop copy of the documentary film Tsar to Lenin. Uh, Tsar to Lenin was released in 1937, and it remains the definitive documentary account of the Russian Revolution, uh, and, and really one of the greatest documentaries produced in the 20th century. I would encourage everyone to pick up a copy of, of Tsar to Lenin, as well as take advantage of the uh, reduced prices uh, for Comrade North's uh, books today. I would also ask everyone to become involved uh, in the ICFI, uh, get involved in the socialist movement, <coughs> as our discussion today has made all too clear the great issues that motivated the revolutionary struggles of, of 1917 are present today. And the essential conclusion that must be drawn is to join and become involved in building a socialist leadership uh, of the international working class today. There is a link uh, on the web page uh, to get involved. And you can also go to wsws.org slash join. Uh, finally, uh, we need resources. We have the intellectual capital uh, of the great writings of, of Marx Engels, Lenin, uh, Trotsky. Uh, we also need uh, financial resources to put out the World Socialist website to make events like this uh, possible. Please make a contribution to the WSWS as part of your commemoration of 1917. The WSWS works every day to clarify the world situation and provide a perspective to unite the working class against imperialist war, social inequality, and all the ravages of the dying capitalist system. Please do not underestimate the need for your financial support. Uh, and finally, uh, we do ask everyone who's listening, if you have not registered for the lecture series yet, please do so. Uh, we will send you information on this lecture, uh, the uh, recording of this lecture, as well as information on uh, the lectures to come. Uh, the next lecture is uh, next uh, two weeks from today. It's on the subject of the legacy of 1905 and the strategy of the Russian Revolution. The speaker will be Fred Williams, an expert in Russian history and writer for the World Socialist website. Uh, that lecture will be held at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on March 25th, 2017. For most of our listeners in the world, this will actually be one hour uh, different from today's lecture because of the change in time zones or time in the, in the United States due to uh, the transition from standard to daylight time. For example, it's 8 a.m. in Sydney, 3 p.m. in Mexico City, 2.30 a.m. in Mumbai, and 9 p.m. in London. Uh, go to wsws.org slash 1917 
for the full information uh, on this lecture as well as links to uh, the time uh, in your area. Again, I would like to thank uh, Comrade North and thank you to all those who've participated today.